I'm going to start the program. And I just want to say good afternoon. <clears throat> it's so great to see everybody here. We're so pleased that everybody remembered what we did on Friday afternoons a year ago. So it's great that you've uh, been able to come out and join us, even with the Delta virus. Um, you know, our last lecture was in May 2020. So this is a welcome start to a whole new uh, program going forward. Uh, I'm very excited to tell you that David Sweet is joining our program as a co-host. And David, as you know, is an accomplished author. Uh, he's had a long career in news and print media. He's uh, got such an amazing set of contacts and, and range of acquaintances and full of good ideas. So we're going to uh, look forward to David participating in our program. In fact, he's going to introduce today's speaker. Um, the, just remember, Governor Pritzker, it's probably a good idea if you wear your mask, but we also remind everybody we put in new air conditioning and new filtration system for the club just to fight the COVID virus. So we're, I think we're pretty safe, but we want to do that. So David, uh, please come up and uh, introduce today's speaker. It's going to be quite a program. We are going to be very, very uh, thrilled to hear what uh, David has to say. So. Thanks so much, Jen. Uh, this is going to be a great event, I, I guarantee you that. Um, and I can't think of a better event to kick off our 125th anniversary celebration than to welcome back the medal that Alex Smith won here at the 1906 US Open. And as well to uh, introduce and, and bring the uh, person who brought the medal across the Atlantic Ocean, David Mackesy, the historian for Carnoustie Golf Club. And before I uh, turn it over to David, I just wanted to mention a few highlights of Amwentia Golf back in that era, because we were truly on the national stage then. Uh, we were an incredibly important club across the country in terms of golf. Uh, the first three winners of the U.S. Amateur Tournament were all on Wednesday members. Uh, one was Charles Blair McDonald, and then H.A. Wiggum won twice. And then in uh, 1899, despite the misgivings of people from the East Coast, on Wednesday hosted the U.S. Amateur, and it was a very popular event, uh, went off without a hitch. Uh, so you know, we were just huge on the scene. And then in 1906, to host the U.S. Open was really spectacular. And our uh, teaching pro at the time, Willie Anderson, he had won four U.S. Opens, which is pretty amazing. But even more amazing, he had won three in a row. And no one has ever matched that or broken it. Not Jack Nicklaus, not Tiger Woods, not anyone. Uh, so anyway, uh, I'm really excited to introduce David, who I was talking with earlier. He's very enthusiastic, has great knowledge about Anwensia, Carnoustie, and the ties between the two clubs. And I, I just wanted to say, even though he's the Carnoustie historian, he doesn't have a Scottish brogue. So if you were coming here hoping to hear a Scottish brogue, he grew up in Wisconsin, so it's more of a badger brogue. So anyway, David, uh, we, we can't wait. Come up and All from the very much. Uh, now, I do have an accent, to uh, be clear. Uh, my accent uh, is criticized often in Scotland. Wonderful. Help me in this afternoon. Understand me sometimes. They, they don't understand why I don't have that road. But uh, I think in this audience, I'll be fine. So, uh, so thank you again. It's wonderful to be here. I, I am an old uh, old time Lake Forest resident. I spent two years here in the, in the middle 80s, and as a Wisconsin uh, born and bred uh, young man. It was hard to be in Lake Forest in 1985. I like the Green Bay Packers and the 85 Bears were very good to us. So, uh, but with a name like Mackesy, I could get a restaurant reservation. I was telling the table because I could just mispronounce my name to Mackesy and I got reservations <laughs> everywhere in town. So, uh, 85 is a good year for that. But uh, it is an honor to be here uh, to Carnoustie Golf Club. This matters a great deal. Uh, this club is different than most clubs. It is the original artisan golf club, which means that uh, back in the day, 180, 190, 200 years ago, a golf club was generally someone who was royal, ancient, landowner, had resource, could afford a, a golf ball that was made by stuffing feathers in, into the leather. They could afford a golf club that made by a bow maker. 
and, uh, and they could literally spend time on a golf course. These weren't those people. These were uh, a group of you know, people who worked the land, they worked the sea, they were blacksmiths, uh, they worked in factories. And so these people, uh, these artisans, uh, created a golf club in 1842. And it was the first artisan golf club. And so the first for uh, the working class uh, as a golf club. So when this club started, it ended up uh, creating something that was unique in golf. And then with these artisans, uh, you had the true practitioners in golf. They became club makers. Uh, the blacksmiths made the heads for the golf balls that were changing in, in, in structure to, to better perch it. Well, that's a different case for a club. Instead of using wood to hit that ball, you can use steel. And then as the golf ball emerged, then these people would, again, work into other things like with, uh, with the printing lathe. Uh, when the lathe came out, you could actually produce these in quantity. And then you could produce golf balls that were more attached to that kind of a golf club. So they were true, the true practitioners. Everything about golf was a business. It was a hobby, it was a passion. And then they turned out to become pretty good at the, at the sport. So this club, you can see this picture from 1900. Uh, it turns out that this artisan golf club, if you could win that golf club's club championship, that meant you could win US Opens. You could win Australian Open. Uh, the, that wasn't quite open yet in 1905, the Australian, uh, South African. Uh, you could win open championships across the globe if you won that club championship. And they ended up in this world of rivalry. And there were no better rivalries in golf than came out of this group. There were club rivalries. Uh, some of the best club makers would uh, strive to make uh, the, the best club, the most innovative club, play the best golf. But whoever won that club championship could usually write their ticket across the globe. They could find some place where people like here at Onwensia, they wanted to have the best golf pros they could find. The ones who would make clubs for the members, care for the course, know how to care for the course, teach the members, and then maybe bring some glory, like a US Open medal or championship trophy. So this group uh, had member rival, but they also had family rival. And this is the reason why I'm involved at Carnoustie. Uh, this family lived at the club I am a member of in San Francisco. Mom, dad, we built them a cottage the last 25 years of their life. We were their, uh, their, their adopted home in America. So mom and dad had five boys that survived into adulthood, five children that did not in our Carnoustie. Uh, so in America, these five boys played at the top of golf from 1898 to 1936. And this is the family that uh, pioneered Carnoustie golf professionals coming to America. And of course, coming through to uh, Wednesday in 1906 on that glorious day that, uh, that Alex Smith finally found his way to the US Open Championship on this land. So, uh, so Alex, the oldest, came to America in 1898 and he was instantly successful. You can imagine an Arnold Palmer of 1898. He was formidable, he was strong, he would talk to you with purpose, uh, he would never look at his shoes, and they were always clean from the night before. He was that kind of a gentleman, he could play golf. And he knew how to deal with both those who were caddies and those who were captains of industry. It was that kind of a, a golfer and ahead of his time. He met Willie Anderson, your golf pro, and the one who won four championships. He met Willie Anderson in 1898 in the second round of the U.S. Open at Myopia. And that moment, the two of them formed a friendship, a bond that lasts the rest of their lives. And it turns out that wherever Alex Smith and Willie Anderson showed up, a golf major appeared because the best two golfers in America were there. So everybody else came and then they'd have a purse and then they would have the competition. So they had sibling, sibling rivalries because the young man on the left-hand side of Alex who's on the right is Willie. So Willie Smith followed Alex eight weeks later, went to Shinnecock and then the next year came here to Chicago and he went to Midlothian. And Alex of course was here in Chicago at Washington Park. And Willie wins the US Open before Alex does. He wins it in 1899 by 11 strokes, the largest margin of victory ever, finally broken by Tiger Woods at Pebble in, uh, in 2000. So Willie wins the US Open in 1899. Uh, Alex got second in 1898. He's top five in 1899. Alex gets second in a playoff to Willie Anderson in 1901. And then he gets second again in 1905 to Willie Anderson. All those tournaments he was leading coming into the last 36 holes. And all those tournaments he ended up second place. So you had a sibling rivalry and you had a rivalry with Willie Anderson. You also had a rivalry with the grip in a golf club. 
Alice gripped it like it was a baseball bat. A lot of uh, Chandler Egan did. Uh, Willie Anderson did. A lot of the players used the interlocking grip, the one that by Harry Varden thought was, was uh, the right kind of grip. So there was still a rivalry there. There was a rivalry between St. Andrews and Carnoustie. Uh, you had a St. Andrews professional. Uh, Carnoustie came here to Onwensia and they called it a club championship. And we'll get to the results in a moment. Uh, but there was also a rivalry with golf balls. B.F. Goodrich dominated the golf ball manufacturing. They had the patent on the Haskell, the rubber court ball. So they literally were everything in golf. Uh, Goodyear Tire and Rubber couldn't stand that. So they went innovatively and created a golf ball that was pneumatic, that pressurized air inside. And that's fabulous. But you know, once in a while, the tire does blow. So, and the rule is once it, it, if that ball did lose its air, you had to play the biggest piece to the hole. <laughs> Any good place after, after you hold out. Um, so you had a self, you had Goodyear's golf ball, you had Goodrich's golf ball, you had interlocking grip, you had a baseball grip, you had Alex and Willie, you had Carnoustie against St. Andrews, you had amateur against professional, and you had homebreds against those who came from, from overseas. Then you had Chicago against New York. Uh, in 1898, uh, Chicago brought in some of the best golf professionals from, from Great Britain because they were sick and tired of New York dominating golf. By 1899, Chicago was the center of championship golf. And Willie Anderson, along with his brother Alex, along with Polis, uh, Fred Hurd, uh, they, were, they were winning all the championships. That U.S. Open trophy, the original, uh, spent 1899 in Chicago, 1900 in Chicago, 1901 in Chicago. Uh, in, in 1900, literally, that trophy, Harry Barden won it, but he couldn't take it back to Great Britain. So it went back to Midlothian for a second year because David Bell from Carnoustie was third, but uh, the top American resident finisher. So Chicago was knocking it out of the park, and, uh, and New York was in a, a subordinate position. So you had all these rivalries going on. In the middle of this golf tournament. And so we get to 1906 and Alex Smith decided that he, they all came back from Mexico from the Mexico Open and they came back to the States. And in February, he went to, uh, to Ohio to talk to the folks from Goodyear. And they convinced him to try this pneumatic golf ball because they improved it. In 1905, the golf ball was simply pneumatic. It was simply rubber, rubber core, I mean, a hollow core uh, with 1,200 pounds of pressure. And in extreme temperature, it just simply wasn't going to work uh, consistently uh, the, the way a professional golfer would have to have it. So in 1906, they put silk around it and they changed it from pneumatic to silk pneumatic. So now we could hold up. So Alex went to Columbia and won a tournament. He went back to uh, Goodyear in Akron and said, play it again. I said, I'll, I'll play with your ball. He came out here and won the Western Open with the silk pneumatic. And then he came here and Willie Anderson still playing the rubber core. His dear friend, Willie Anderson, still playing the rubber core. And to know how dear that friend is, this is 1900 in January in Oakland, California, where they played together in a tournament where they traveled together in California. This is Alex and Willie playing in 1905 at the, uh, at the inauguration of the Metropolitan Open. They tied, they went to a playoff, and Alex actually prevailed. But Willie had won four U.S. Opens. Alex couldn't win the U.S. Open. So here in Wensia in 1906, the world of golf was coming. All these rivalries, rivalries were going on. And, uh, and there's the boys, Willie, Alex, and Willie Anderson, and Fred McLeod, who was here in the Chicago, Chicago land area. So these guys were all going to play, they believe, for the championship. Only Alex of this group was playing the silk and that. Now, uh, Nipper Campbell from Brookline was playing with it. Uh, Robert Simpson was playing with it. The, the Nickel Boys were playing with it. Um, a lot of guys were playing. Uh, James Maiden was playing with it. So there were a good uh, dozen top golfers playing silk and that. But uh, only Alex could hit it well. Now you got to go to Goodyear and say, why were they so interested in this? And, and what, what made the golf ball special? And they said, here's, here's the list of things that made it special. It would go farther on the drive. It would go straighter on the drive. It would roll better on the fairway. It would have more feel towards the green. It would roll the green better, and it would fall in the cup easier, and it would stay in the cup. That's not bad. 
<laughs> it's all big. Now, maybe there's a little puffery in there. Maybe they kind of oversold it a little bit. What they didn't tell you is that if it did get too cold or it did get too hot, then you did run the risk. And if you change the golf ball, now you're going to be in that spot where now you've got to hit two different golf balls uh, you know, during the round. And these golf balls play completely different. It, it, the way Goodyear described it, if you put 200 pounds of pressure, just to use a number, 200 pounds of pressure on a regular golf ball and a silk pneumatic, the silk pneumatic will go 10% uh, further. So 220 yards versus 200 yards. On a 100 yard shot, if you put 100 pounds of pressure, it would be equal to a Haskell. On an 80 yard shot, you got to give it extra juice because uh, it's going to go shorter than a regular golf ball. So you had to really play with feel with this golf ball. And Alex with that baseball grip knew how to play. So he comes here at the Long Valencia, and he'd been here often, right? He was here in 1898 with, uh, in a, a professional tournament because he played here when he was in Chicago. He played against Freddie Hurd and, uh, and uh, Polis and uh, it, with your guy, James Anderson. They played a, a, a tournament here for 100 bucks in 1898. He caddied for one of your members. Alex caddied for one of your members in the 1899 Amateur Championship, uh, Walter B. Smith, because everybody wanted to have the professionals as caddies. He grew up as a caddy. So uh, he'd been here often. Well, he got here in, in 1906. He was sick and tired of losing to Willie Anderson. And, uh, and uh, Willie's got three in a row now, going for four at his home club. And that's self pneumatic ball. And Alex Smith got along like dear friends. So Alex comes out with a 73, second round 74. And it was a hot day, but the next day, we cool off. Golf ball was going to perform just marvelously. Uh, so Alex and Nipper Campbell were the first tee, both with symptomatic golf balls on the second day. And there's a storm coming. So they said, you know what we'll do? We'll wait. We'll wait a half an hour. It won't start yet. And they said, okay, good. There's a clearing. Let's go. By the time we got to the green, it was torrential. You know, 10 minutes later, of course, Chicago weather, the rain comes along. He played through a rainstorm and shot another 74, where nobody else could. Willie Anderson shot an 81. So he was ahead by two strokes when he started the last 36. And he finished seven strokes ahead of his own brother, who finished second, Willie Smith. Third place uh, was someone Alex knew very well. His wife's name was Jesse Maiden. And third place was his brother-in-law, James Maiden. So first, second, and third at on Wednesday, 1906, on June 29th, it was a Carnoustie Golf Club Championship on uh, Wednesday. The U.S. Open, the top three finishers were Carnoustie Golf Club members. And then when it came to St. Andrews, St. Andrews had three guys in the top 20. Carnoustie had eight. And so this was top of the mountain for Carnoustie. On Wednesday, I met a great deal to the club. And of course, to Alex Smith. So Alex Smith earns a gold medal. He gets it with the silk pneumatic golf ball. The silk pneumatic golf ball now is the rage across America. If Alex Smith can play this, I want to play. Well, the same thing happened to Willie Anderson. He said, you know, if I want to beat Alex Smith ever again, I got to start playing with that stuff in that golf ball. So Alex, so Alex convinced him, and he talked to the guys at Goodyear, and, Al, and then Willie became the paid sponsor of the stuff in that. And Willie came back here a month and a half later and shot a 69. And uh, so, so Willie, uh, his friend, his dear friend Alex, uh, and he both played with self pneumatic for the rest of that year. The following year, there were more improvements, but you know, Great Britain wouldn't allow the self pneumatic to be played over there. They had rules against it. They had a different size and uh, they wouldn't allow it. Alex did not defend his 1906 US Open title. He went to Great Britain instead to play the Open Championship, which was on the same, in the same week as the US Open. So Alex didn't defend his 1906. He went to Great Britain to play. Uh, Willie uh, tried again. And, and Willie actually never did win another US Open, but uh, uh, they, they remained friends till, till the day they died. But on this course, Willie Anderson set the course record with the silk pneumatic. So this medal, uh, Alex was a man of purpose. He didn't grow up on a golf course. Uh, he grew up like a lot of people in Scotland, uh, the, not the romantic part. He grew up in, in the industrialized slums of Dundee, Scotland, which meant that you worked in a jubna, which was what we know as burlap and, and rough, coarse materials. Uh, this was so rough and so coarse, and that the, the plants reflected it. And this uh, product coming in from India 
would be pulverized, repurposed, and then created into a fabric. Uh, at 10 years old, that was your, your path in life in, in the industrialized Dundee. So at 10 years old, Alan Smith was going to become a factory worker, what they call a half-timer, half-time in school, half-time in a factory, with the benefit being that the smaller the human, the closer the machines can be and the more productive the plant. The, the misery spread across the human population uh, so simply was a must to compete in the, in the jute trade. And it was at 10 years old that uh, mom and dad said, we're taking Alex and our boys and we're moving out to Joanne, his wife's uh, place of birth. So they moved out to a, a little town area that was kind of known as Carnoustie, but really known more as Barry Parish in Pambride Parish. And the railroad had just, had just come through a couple of decades earlier and now it was becoming popular. So 1883, he gets to Scotland and the same year, Robert Simpson comes to Carnoustie and the two of them, Robert Simpson in club making and Alan Smith as his foreman, uh, they become a grand partnership. Uh, Robert Simpson was as good as it got when it came to club making and as good of an employer as it got. Alex uh, was as good of a foreman as he ever had. Uh, and then people like George Lowe followed him and Robert Simpson, uh, a different Robert Simpson, a different family followed inside that building. That's what created the, the formidableness of this, of, of these players, of these club makers, of these people who could deal with those here in America, like the Alwinsian members. So when Alice won this medal, everything changed in golf history. One, Willie Anderson didn't win it again. Two, Carnoustie finally got back onto the winners in the winner's circle on the top of the pedestal. Three, uh, they, Alex became a celebrity. He wrote a book. Uh, the people at Atlanta Athletic Club said, you know what we want? We want to have the best pro in America here for our brand new golf course. So they brought Alex down to work at Atlanta Athletic Club at East Lane. And with Alex came his assistant, James Maiden, his brother-in-law, and the one who got third in the US Open. And so the two of them worked in 1906. Alex comes back out to Nassau, leaves Jimmy Maiden down in East Lake. Two years later, Alex has to have Jimmy come back to Nassau. That's where Jimmy was. So you gotta bring Jimmy back to Nassau. Who are we gonna send to East Lake? How about our little uh, brother, you know, Alex's brother-in-law, Stuart Maiden. Stuart should go down to East Lake. Jimmy, you come up here to Nassau. So this gentleman, Stuart Maiden, becomes a golf professional at East Lake. And a young eight-year-old is following Stuart Maiden around the golf course imitating his swing. And uh, Robert Tyre Jones Jr. Uh, ends up playing golf instead of tennis because he just loved watching that guy swing the golf club. And Stewart is on the right. Bobby Cruikshank is in the, the next to him. Bobby Jones is second to the left. And James Maiden is on the far left. And this is the 1923 playoff. So based on 1906 and Alex's win and going down to East Lake and then having to take his brother-in-laws down there because he couldn't stay, uh, created a guy named Bobby Jones. So then you fast forward to this trophy in 1930, and now Bobby Jones is the best amateur golfer in the world, the best professional golfer in the world, is the young man on dad's lap, McDonald Smith, in the bottom right. So McDonald Smith came to the US in 1908. In 1910, Alex Smith wins this gold medal in a playoff with his brother at Philadelphia. 1930, Alex had just passed. Tough time for the family. McDonald is the top professional golfer in the world. And at, at Hoy Lake in the Open Championship, He's two strokes behind Bobby Jones. Top money, no medal. At Interlock in July of 1930, Bobby Jones is going for the third of his championships, right? Two that the pros are invited to, the Open and the US Open, and two that only the amateurs can go to, the US amateur and the British amateur. So in 1930, McDonald Smith is one stroke behind Bobby Jones with one hole to go. Uh, Bobby Jones hits the miracle putt on 18, a 40 foot bender was uphill. And when it dropped, he again became the US Open champion with McDonald Smith in second place. Top money, no medal. So that trophy has come really close with the Smiths, but three times they've had it in their hands. And the, the first of them, where Alex was right here in Alexia. 
And that is the centerpiece of the Carnoustie collection in Scotland. And just to give you one quick uh, set of understanding of golf in Scotland, most of these courses you see on the Rota are royal or honorable gentlemen. Uh, but two of them, St. Andrews and Carnoustie, are public parks, uh, much like Harding Park in San Francisco. It's owned and operated by the city or over there by the community. And then the clubs are adjacent to it, but have no managerial ownership rights. They're just clubs adjacent to a public park. And it's that public park that has created uh, the platform for generations of fantasy golf professionals coming to America and teaching the game. And when we at Carnegie Golf Club uh, in 1931, when, we, when the, the Lynx hosted their first Open Championship, that's the, the year, of course, that Alex Smith passed. And that's the year that McDonald Smith, his youngest brother, the top professional golfer in the world, brought Alex's collection of gold medals that he bequeathed to the club of his childhood, the club where his, his mates, uh, people who he made clubs with, he was a blacksmith apprentice, uh, people who worked in the factories, people who worked the land, people he grew up with, he bequeathed his entire Hall of Fame collection to Carnoustie Golf Club. In 1949, when McDonald Smith passed, his Hall of Fame collection of gold medals were bequeathed to join his brothers at Carnoustie Golf Club. And my club in Diablo, San Francisco, the home, the adopted home for the Smith family, uh, we house the, the silver, the uh, Players U.S. Open Trophy, the uh, Western Open Trophy, the Metropolitan, the Alex Smith Memorial Medal. So those are the things that, um, that we have and we share with Carnoustie Golf Club. And we do these kind of events in places where this family earned their medal, earned their stripes, championships, raised their families, triumph and tragedy. So this, this today here on Wednesday is so important to us because we get to tell the story of a grand champion one of our grandest members. And the thing that we have that physically manifested Alex's 1906 gold medal that he was presented here at Alexia. So that is the Alexia portion of what I wanted to share today. And uh, I just want to tell you that uh, Carnoustie Golf Club, uh, as a historian, I can tell you how honored we are that we get this chance to spend time with you and, and tell you the stories about Alex in this place and how it changed Carnoustie history, golf history, and uh, it means so much even to this day and for our future at Carnoustie Golf. So, thank you. Yeah, I, I did bring two things that, that's all that relates to on Wednesday. So the silk pneumatic golf ball, uh, the medal, and then your your replica uh, course trophy. Because if you host an Open, U.S. Open, you get to have one. If you host 10, you get to have one. And the U.S. Open Championship trophy, if you win 10, you get to have one. So Alex's trophy and your trophy from the hosting and then the medal. Up here, this just manifests more of, of my travels over this next week and a half and Alex's life. This is the 1910 medal that, of course, he won at Philadelphia. And then this is uh, in honor of Alex. So uh, Walter Hagen, I don't know if many of you know about Walter Hagen, but he was grand, right? He's the one that would spread out uh, a tablecloth at the first green and, or first uh, tee and have caviar because he wasn't welcome into the clubhouse. He had real panache, real style. He would, he would drive a limo up and say, you won't let me do that, so I'm gonna eat my meal and my champagne and my limo. Uh, so he, he didn't uh, stand for all the things that some things would happen in Great Britain where they wouldn't let you in the clubhouse. But Walter Hagen was grand and he had a style. And he won a lot. And he won uh, his second PGA championship just south of town in the Olympia Fields. And this trophy, the Wanamaker, the biggest trophy in golf, that's really cool if you're Robin Wanamaker because you give it to a porter and then your, your staff takes care of it. If you're a golf professional and you win the Robin Wanamaker trophy, I mean, you're getting back on a Pullman car and you're, or maybe in your other car, but you got to bring all your stuff with you and this enormous biggest trophy in golf. So Walter had a great idea. He had a $5 bill in his pocket and he had the Wanamaker. And so he gave the Wanamaker and a $5 bill to a taxi driver. He said, take this to my hotel. Great. Then he could go up with his boys and have some beers. So uh, the next morning he had to go over to Iowa for a, uh, a golf tournament. So he had to leave ODAR 30, so really early in the morning. 
So, trophy? Yeah, I know, it's handled, right? Well, it turns out it wasn't handled. They didn't know where it was. So 1926 comes and Walter goes to the PGA Championship. They say, hey, listen, Walter, where's the trophy? He says, I'm gonna win anyways, I didn't bring it. <laughs> so he won, he won, uh, 1927. Hey, Walter, where's that trophy? Going to win anyways, didn't bring it. He won, uh, four times in a row now, 1928. Where's that trophy? He didn't win. And it was humiliating because the mayor of Baltimore was there. They were gonna have a ceremony and Leo Deagle won. There's no trophy. So they took the Maryland Open trophy and made it a stand-in so, so the mayor could hand something to the winner. And the PGA was done. They said, okay, we have to make a new one. The Wanamaker's gone forever. So they made this trophy. And this trophy then was held by Leo Deagle in 1929 and Tommy Armour in 1930. And so Leo, those two PGA champions held this trophy. Well, 1931, uh, Walter Hagen had to move out of his golf club equipment business in Grand Rapids. So they're getting everything collected in the basement is his box, the Wanamaker. So now we got the Wanamaker. Well, coincidentally, the same year, Alex Smith had passed. Alex Smith boycotted the PGA Championship because it was match play. He wouldn't play against the player. He only played against the golfers. So a guy who boycotted the PGA Championship, Alex Smith, was then honored with a medal for the top medalist qualifier, the person who was the lowest scorer in the two rounds of qualifying would earn the Alex Smith Memorial Medal. And that was great. And now we got two trophies. So this trophy, they said, why don't we make this one, the PGA Championship trophy for 1929-1930. Let's just re-etch it. Take names like Jim Barnes and Jock Hutchison and Walter Hagen off of it, and let's put on the names of the medalist qualifiers. And so this became the Alex Smith Memorial Trophy and was held by uh, Gene Sarazen, Walter Hagen, uh, Bob Olin Dutra, uh, Hogan, Hagen, Sneed, Nelson. It's, it's a who's who of uh, PGA Hall of Fame golfers uh, through the match play era, 1931 through 1955. So because uh, in 56, they didn't do qualifying. Uh, at the tournament anymore. So for 25 years, the best golfers in America now have their names etched on here and the best golfers in America's names were taken off of it in 1931 to make it this. So this actual trophy is one of the seven original golf major championship trophies on the planet. Uh, Challenge belt, uh, Claire Jug, Masters, US Open, PGA Wanamaker, and the Alex Griffin. So this is, we take this uh, back in New York, where they actually handed this trophy out to Tommy Armour. That's where I'm going with it for, in a week or so. But that's how, that's the kind of guy Alex Smith was. He just simply was Arnold Palmer of his day. Uh, all the pros wanted to be around him, all the captains of industry wanted to be around him. Uh, the, uh, the, the, the caddies wanted to be around him. Uh, his fellow professionals, it was, he was just that guy. And so we celebrate him to this day and he did it for a particular purpose. And this is the purpose. This is what they said when they bequeathed their collections to stir young ambitions in golf to similar lofty levels of achievement. They wanted the, the, the children and their children and their children to be inspired by this collection. And that's the purpose for, for Bill Thompson uh, and myself to, with this collection, make these kinds of presentations to let people know that Alex's mission and McDonald's mission from a long time ago, two Hall of Fame golfers who, who grew up in desperate circumstances to rise to the top of Oh, that's why. Well, let's take questions. Uh, we have quite a resource here. And you're not going to find very many places in the United States when it comes to golf. So I don't know if anybody has any questions or wants to uh, engage David. No? Good question. Uh, understanding that from Rusty, like uh, St. Andrews, is actually a public golf course, but, but with clubs around it that are local ball. If uh, Jeb shows up at Sunday school and says, I'm a Muncie member, is that really any good? Uh, I could tell you that there'd be many members who would say, oh, let me show you a medal. Because they're very proud. Um, what, we, what we do today is uh, Carnoustie, like St. Andrew's Golf Club, which was Tom Morris's golf club, because Tom Morris never got to walk into the front door of the RM. Uh, he was always at his own artisan golf club. And St. Andrew's Golf Club was, they copied Carnoustie. So in 1843, a year later, 
St. Andrews formed their artisan golf club. And so the artisan golf clubs uh, formed so that the, the, the local players who played on the public course could have competitions. And that was the real purpose of it, a place to gather, a place to do it. But they didn't have clubhouses, right? These were uh, people of ordinary means. So they would be at local taverns, uh, uh, public houses. And it wasn't until about the turn of the century uh, that clubhouses like this, this was 1898, that clubhouse got built. So they were very proud of it uh, in 1900. Uh, so in 1900, or actually 1892, it was the Carnoustie, uh, the land was purchased from private hands and put into the public. And with that came the rules that if you live in the town, you can play. And then they formalized the rules over time. So now it's gotten to the point today where if you live in Carnoustie, own a home in Carnoustie, you can apply for what they call a ticket. And a ticket allows you an opportunity to play on the golf course. Now it's like a Green Bay Packer ticket uh, for season tickets for us. Uh, you have to wait a long time. Uh, but uh, for those who have a Carnoustie Championship ticket, they can play during member hours. So Carnoustie has a couple hours in the morning, part time in the middle of the day, where people like us can't play because it's member times. And so there are occasions where if you call up the captain and say, hey, listen, I'm coming over uh, uh, for a chance to play, you'd say, go on and buy your time and, and do it like you normally would. And uh, you know, if we end up in a chance where, because they only book those five days, if we have a chance to, to, to play another game together, uh, maybe, maybe we will. Right? So it's, it's just that soft and light. But what we've done is uh, there are 200 now overseas members for Carnoustie Golf Club. Uh, and, and those overseas members, uh, like up in uh, Economowoc or in New York, where I'm going, uh, we play our own clubs here. Okay? So, so uh, if people from New York are coming to San Francisco, they always make a day to come out to Diablo because there are fellow Carnoustie Golf Club members at Diablo. And if I'm in New York or some of our members are in New York, they'll go to Nassau or Waikiki. Uh, and so, so that Smith Society, we call it, uh, we have that kind of here in North America. Uh, in, in St. Andrews and Carnoustie, uh, those, are, those are really hard. We all, when we travel, we always get our times. We buy them uh, like, 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 uh, like they're sold. You know, and they're hard to get. Uh, but uh, for members, they have that. Yeah, there's no case where they can have a guest. Yeah, yeah but, but they are public parks. You know, uh, only two got married, only one had children, uh, and uh, and then the, the the line ended. Yeah, yeah. So they they uh, as as wonderful as they were, uh, they 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 lived in a time when their profession made it very hard to 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 live a, a regular life. Yeah, but Alex did. And he had two daughters. Yeah, but but yeah, there's there are no descendants now. Yeah, yeah the maiden family does that. Yeah. I have a question. Um, your uh, your dissertation about the, the silver pneumatic golf ball is interesting because apparently were, I was here before the your presentation, my friend and I were having a similar discussion on golf balls, which one we should play, how it would help us, and all this sort of thing. Right. Did this silk pneumatic golf club, is, are there any surviving examples of it? I have one here on the table. And, and do they have yeah. that dimples on it? Uh, it does, it does have. And did it really work? It really, really worked. It really worked. Uh, here's the story of why the pro stopped playing. So 1907, Nipper Campbell was playing it. And he's one stroke off the lead. And on the, 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 the third 18 hole round, on hole number five, People turned their heads because there was an explosion. The ball exploded. And so the biggest part ended up in the bucket. He had to play it to the hole. It took a seven uh, on a par four, but he had gotten pars on the other three times with, with bogey. Um, they called it bogey in the day. Uh, so because he lost the US Open then by three strokes to Alec, the pros are like, you can't do it. It was a hot day. Right. Didn't wasn't a hot day here in on Wednesday a day two. It was raining. It was kind of cool. The ball performed wonderfully, but you couldn't rely on it. So the silk pneumatic went away after that explosion. Now Alex Smith always said that it was a it was a funny ball because it uh, it did play differently. Uh, once in a while it would um, it would blow up in your golf bag, 
And, and he said once it blew up in someone's pocket, which caused great excitement. <laughs> so, so it only had two years of life. Uh, Goodyear went on to other things. And uh, so it did have two grand years of life. And by the way, I'm going to say this because I, I think I've mentioned it to David. The actual golf ball signed by Alex that he won here with, it sits in New Jersey at the USGA Museum. And so that golf ball uh, is still uh, available for public display and, and, uh, and still exists. We'll see, we're having the, the director of the museum talk to us in January. And I know what I would ask her. <laughs> Can we have the ball here? That's what I, I would ask her. Hey, listen, you got it downstairs right now. It's not on this one. You've got it downstairs right now. Could we borrow? Yeah, well, bring that up. Yeah, it is the uh, signed by Alex, the one that he finished his first U.S. Open Championship with right here. I'm going to ask Nick to step up for a minute and just talk about uh, this big weekend and his relationship with David. But come on up. In the meantime, this year our headliner for a big 125th anniversary. What a great way to start a weekend that we've got lined up. So congratulations to you. Uh, not only that, because he's also a fountain of golf memorabilia and history. And I know you you guys have talked about Yeah, we've been pen pals or phone yeah. pals for, for quite a while. So and we uh, we took a group across to Carnoustie just a couple of years ago. Everybody hear me okay? We took a group a couple of years ago to Carnoustie and, and saw the medal uh, in its case and uh, the, uh, and the US Open trophy. So um, there's a huge connection, obviously, we've talked about it in the past, and a lot of you have heard me talk about this probably too much, but our connection with, with St. Andrews and Carnoustie is obviously very, very tight. Our first several pros were from that area, where they call, I didn't sure you mentioned this earlier, where Carnoustie is the cradle of golf, right? You mentioned that, I'm sure, and we all say St. Andrews is the home of golf, but um, so for, and I guess personally for me, it's just, it's always been a bit of a pilgrimage every year to go across and be lucky enough to be at the St. Andrews Golf Club, as you mentioned earlier. And have a links ticket at St. Andrews. But St. Andrews, you can, if you're a member of a local club, you can get a links ticket if you wait, it takes a long time. In Carnoustie, you have to live in the town to be able to qualify. So if I were a Carnoustie Golf Club member, I couldn't necessarily get a Carnoustie ticket. I believe that's correct. Right. right. You, you, have to you have to live in the town. So it's uh, a little bit tougher in Carnoustie to get that ticket. So uh, so yeah, it's it's one of the uh, it's one of the great fun things that I've been able to do over the years is to really study how how much history we have here at the club and how important it is. Uh, for us, as we make decisions, kind of moving forward. So um, I'm, not sure, I'm not sure what else. We're looking forward to tomorrow. We have That's 400 and some folks. We have a good folks. trip coming up in Scotland. Yeah, right? we do. We're going to take a bunch of first timers across. Yeah. Um, we're going to spend one night in St. Andrews, so uh, so the folks can stand on the bridge, uh, <laughs> get a little sneak peek, and then uh, we're going to head to the west coast and Northern Ireland. Come back home, knock on wood that um, we can get there safely and things don't change here over the next 10 days. So fingers crossed. But uh, have you already talked about so tomorrow? I was no, waiting here, but 400 plus, 400, 420 for the polo match tomorrow, which is going to be exciting. Did you tell, tell them the story that during the Open that there was a polo match going on? There were more people at the polo match than, than the U.S. Open? So June 29th, you guys were playing uh, a, a three-way with St. Louis and Kansas City. So if you were a golfer, you had to listen to this adjacent to you. I mean, you literally could put them in play if you had a bad golf ball. Uh, but uh, there was a greater crowd for the ball match by far than there was for the golf match. Although the golf match crowd was pretty good. But uh, but yeah, you guys, uh, when it came to polo, there was nothing better on Wednesday. Yeah. Well, David Sweet is the person who organized all this. David, any comments? Uh, it's, it's been terrific. And uh, what a great way to start the weekend. David was orchestrating. And Jerry's going to ask you a question here. What's a quick question? Yeah, um, it, yeah I, I think the official answer is that the RNA declared at one point, but um, like even at Presswick, the, the whole they, they didn't number them 18 of them, but they did play to that number. They, they did find their way to play to 18 holes times two, 36, uh, just by chance. A lot of the clubs weren't that way. A lot of the clubs were 15 holes or 
21 holes or, or different numbers. So, but the RNA at 1.1 has some similarity. So they, so they, they enforced that it would be 18. Uh, the US Open was a 36 hole competition until 1898 when it became a, a 72 hole competition. Yeah, but it was 36 in one day because the clubs didn't want to give up their golf course to the professionals for more than a day. Uh, and then they said, okay, two days. And then sooner or later, it was okay, we give you three days. But uh, even this medal has the wrong date on it. Because when you make a, a medal for US Open Championship, you make the front, you make the back, you make the club, all the notes and the date. And then you etch in the name at the very end. So like with Alex, you can see that the date was already there. Just the Alex Smith was put in. Well, in Philadelphia, they went to a playoff. And so they already had the date in there on a Saturday. But they also had member play on Sunday. You're not playing on Sunday. So they played on Monday. But the date is still Saturday on the medal. Uh, so, but, but yes, it, it was always 18 holes just by tradition. And then it became enforced in terms of governance. Any other questions? Well, David, that was fantastic. Thank you so much for being here. What a compelling presentation. And we all appreciate it. It's the best way to start our 125th anniversary weekend, I can imagine. And uh, I just wanted to check if you're available for the 150th anniversary <laughs> celebration. Uh, we still have an opening, so. <laughs> <Not really. laughs> but anyway, uh, thanks for everyone for showing up. I hope you all learned a lot and enjoyed it. So thank you. Oh, gosh.